As one of the most anticipated events of 2024, marking the beginning of the world's largest sports event, the Paris Olympics 2024 is predicted to become a massive media sensation. However, things did not go as expected when many people called this the most scandalous Olympic opening ceremony ever. It seems there is a mysterious message at the Paris Olympics that everyone has overlooked. Could this be the fulfillment of the prophecies mentioned in the Bible? Has that time arrived? And should humanity now be afraid? Pale Horse of Death, The Last Supper, and The Mockery through live performances and televised broadcasts. As part of the Olympic opening ceremony, one of the acts included a gendarmerie officer riding on a metal horse on the parade route along the Seine River. The horsewoman was wearing a cape printed with the flag of the International Olympic Committee. This scene reminds us a similar scene appeared in the Revelation book. It's a single rider on a pale horse is straight out of the book of Revelation and then quoted, And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name that sat on him was Death, and Hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth, to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. According to the Bible, the term pale horse implies death. The above verse translates to a pale horse approaching, matching the color of its rider, who is identified as death. They are closely followed by Hades, who is the god of the underworld, and ruled over the dead according to ancient Greek religion. They were given power over a quarter of the earth to kill people with swords, hunger, disease, and wild animals. The pale horse with rider symbolizes the culmination of the human destructive cycle which was initiated by the previous horses. The white horse identified with conquest and deceit. The red horse, which represents the devastations of the war, and the black horse, which represents economic disparity and manipulation. The pale horse is said to be the ultimate consequence of a society that has fully immersed itself into imperialism, militarism, economic exploitation, widespread death, and decay. The concept of the pale horse piqued the interest of netizens as they associated the Revelation quote and called it death. In the book of Revelation in the Bible, these four horsemen are described as harbingers of the end times, along with bringing about various forms of destruction and chaos upon the world. Each of the four horsemen rides a different colored horse, symbolizing different aspects of their mission. The white horse represents conquest or pestilence, the red horse symbolizes war, the black horse signifies famine, and the pale horse is associated with death. Not only this, but together, they are seen as agents of divine judgment and the unfolding of apocalyptic events. The imagery of the horsemen of the apocalypse has been influential in art, literature, and popular culture, often used to depict themes of divine retribution, the fragility of human existence. Not only that. Another message from the Paris Olympic is coming to us now. The parade down the River Seine featured plenty of eye-catching moments that sparked online fervor, including one now particularly infamous scene that outraged many Christians who lambasted its resemblance to Leonardo da Vinci's famed Last Supper painting. In the performance broadcast during the ceremony, a woman wearing a silver halo-like headdress stood at the center of a long table with drag queens posing on either side of her. Later, at the same table, a giant cloche lifted, revealing a man, nearly naked and painted blue, on a dinner plate surrounded by fruit. He broke into a song as, behind him, the drag queens danced. Some strongly expressed the view that the Last Supper performance during the opening ceremonies of the Paris Olympics was not art, it was satanic warfare and mental illness on full display. In the last days, mockers will come. Many people believe this is nothing short of mockery. The Bible tells us that one of the signs of the last days is that people will go out of their way to blaspheme God. That will be a distinguishing characteristic of the Antichrist, whom the scripture says will blaspheme God. 
Even as God's judgment is falling on non-believers during the tribulation, Revelation 16, 9 says, And men were scorched with great heat, and they blasphemed the name of God who has power over these plagues. And they did not repent and give him glory. Blasphemy represents the conscious denouncing and rejection of God. It is a defiant irreverence, the sin of intentionally and openly speaking evil against God. To commit this sin does not merely represent unbelief, but determined unbelief. The beast blasphemes not only God, but also those who dwell in heaven. In Psalm 73, Asaph described arrogant, prosperous people as setting their mouths against the heavens. And Psalm 74, 18 calls foolish those who revile the name of God. The beast will blaspheme God and display enormous pride, but he is foolish to do so and ultimately will discover where his foolishness lands him. In Leviticus, God pronounced the death penalty for anyone who blasphemed his name. He said, Whoever blasphemes the name of the Lord shall surely be put to death. All the congregation shall stone him. The Lord will put a sudden end to the beast's blasphemy by consigning him to eternal punishment in the lake of fire. One of the signs leading up to the end times is the sign of mockers who will come, following after their own lusts, taunting Christians with words of doubt, denying the promise of his second coming. Peter, moved by the Holy Spirit, wrote about this mockers in end times in his second letter, but it was also alluded to by Jesus himself in several parables he told about his return. The sign given by the Apostle Peter reads, Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. Peter is pointing out that a sign that will become evident in the last days will be people, unbelievers and even those that profess to be Christians, mocking. In effect, they are saying that the promise of his coming is not going to be fulfilled. Why? Because they claim that all things continue as they were from the beginning. In other words, it's business as usual. No need to be ready for a second coming. Things continue to go on just as they always have. What they are not being mindful of is that 2,000 years to the Lord is as a day. He does not measure time as we do. To him, it was just yesterday that he arose from the grave. He specifically told his disciples that although they would not know the day or the hour, they would be able to tell the signs of the end time that would precede his return. He will come on a day and hour that you expect not. In the Old Testament, the prophets wrote that Israel would be scattered throughout the earth. That happened in 70 AD, when the Romans invaded Israel, destroyed the city, and the remnant of Israel fled across the earth. Over the last 2,000 years, Jews have been scattered throughout the whole earth, in literally every tribe and nations. The first big signpost was Israel starting the return to their land in the latter 1800s and 1900s and Israel once again becoming a nation in 1948. Never in history has a people survived 2,000 year while scattered across the whole earth, only to return to their land and become a nation once again. This return of Israel had never happened before, and as such was another fulfillment of prophecy, which was to precede the last days. Jesus said, learn the parable of the fig tree, Jesus told his followers the following parable which is recorded in the Gospels of Matthew 24, 32, 33 and Luke 21, 29, 31. Jesus is comparing Israel to a fig tree and is saying that when you see this fig tree planted, Israel, and you see it begin to shoot forth leaves, begin to thrive, then know that the kingdom is near. Over the past 1,100 years, the land of Israel had fallen into a barren wasteland. No trees could be found, and practically nothing could be grown there. Since the Jews started to return to the land in the latter 1800s and early 20th century, and since the found of the State of Israel, there is a tremendous blossoming of Israel. 
Trees have now sprouted all over the land, and Israel is a major exporter of fruit to the whole region. The times of the Gentiles are now coming to a close. It is estimated that more Jews have come to accept Jesus as their Messiah in the last 10 years than in the last 2,000 years. This too is a sign of the end time that has never happened in the past 2,000 years. The Bible predicts that in the last days the Jews would begin believing in Jesus as the times of the Gentiles comes to a close. We are in those end times. Would Christ have been offended? This is important because mockery is a challenge many Christians face, yet Jesus Christ's response to mockery offers profound lessons. Jesus Christ faced intense mockery throughout his ministry, especially during his trial and crucifixion. Despite this, he remained unoffended, responding with grace and composure. Here are some of the experiences that we can gather from Christ's time during his ministry. First, during his trial, Christ fulfilled Isaiah 53, 7. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Christ was amazingly silent during that excruciating experience where he was not only challenged about his authority, but was also physically broken. Second, Christ, in the presence of mockery, was incredibly forgiving. This is seen as he prayed when he was on the cross, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. Christ muttered these words during his time on the cross and at the time when the Roman soldiers gambled over his clothes. Third, Christ always found a way to use mockery directed toward him as a teaching opportunity by responding with incisive wisdom. In Matthew 22, 15, 22, he turned a trap question on whether to pay taxes to Caesar or not into a eureka moment for all those who were listening by saying, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Thus Christ, during his stint here on earth, handled mockery quite differently from how his disciples did. He handled it quietly, forgivingly, and with much wisdom to be used as an opportunity to introduce himself to the world. Interestingly, the issue involved in this Olympic opening is the Lord's Supper which now we, as Christians, experience at the communion table or Eucharist. Interestingly, the communion table is actually Christ's invitation to the world, including sinners and mockers, to partake in his life and grace. Matthew 11:28 is famously an invitation by Christ to all who are tired and weary when he says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Through communion, a believer remembers our Lord's sacrifice and the forgiveness available through his blood. He also reminds us that he will one day come back for his body of believers as his bride to take it for himself to rule and reign for all eternity. Most of all, the communion unit's believers, breaking down barriers of sin and division, as mentioned in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. The most impressive of all is how Christ invited, treated, and transformed mockers and persecutors to become his most powerful disciples. An example is Saul, who was a Pharisee and a fierce persecutor of Christians who encountered Christ on the road to Damascus. He later became the Apostle Paul, who spread the gospel widely and authored most of the epistles of the New Testament. Likewise, Jesus ate with sinners and converted them, declaring, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This shows that Christ invited sinners and outcasts to know him and be loved by him. Finally, there was a thief on the cross who initially mocked Jesus, but one of the other thieves crucified alongside him later rebuked him. Jesus responded to the thief who repented and came to him for salvation. Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. This demonstrated our Lord's readiness to forgive even in his final moments and that his salvation even to those who have sinned greatly against him. In sum, Jesus Christ's response to mockery, marked by silent endurance, forgiveness, and wise teaching, provides a powerful model for Christians. The communion table symbolizes his inclusive invitation, welcoming all to partake in his life and grace. By responding to mockery with grace, patience, wisdom, and prayer, 
Christians reflect Christ's character and offer a compelling witness to the transformative power of the gospel. However, this must also be a call and reminder to those who openly mock Christ and deny his authority that one day he will once again come back, no longer as a simple man, but as the King of Kings who shall judge the living and the dead. For the question, would Christ have been offended? I think Christ was never offended by mockers who tried to deride him all throughout his ministry. Being God, Christ knows the propensity and depravity of the human condition and the waywardness of their imagination. Because of our sinful nature, all of us have gone astray and are in rebellion against God. That is the reason Christ came to restore man and his creation back to him in full reconciliation. However, this does not mean that mocking and contempt against God and His Son, Jesus Christ, will not have any consequences. This may be analogous to hurling insults and invectives before a powerful judge, yet disregarding the fact that the same judge has the power to condemn you in the end. In this example, the contempt against the judge did not diminish his powers and authority over the person deriding or mocking. Yet at the same time, the mocker must be ready for any consequences. I think he is giving everyone time and inviting all to join him on the table of forgiveness and communion, but not on our own terms, because he alone is Lord. Paris's Olympic ceremony provides a lurid example of how many people, organizations, companies, and leaders of Western societies today push values they call love, inclusion, diversity, tolerance, and freedom. Their overarching thoughts can be summarized as, everyone can do whatever they want. The only boundary is that boundaries must not be set, except everyone for who they are, how they choose to live. This is nothing new. In fact, it has been quite common in history. For instance, ancient Israel's period of judges is characterized with this statement, everyone did what was right in his own eyes as opposed to what was right in God's eyes. God distinguishes right from wrong, specifically by setting boundaries that the Bible describes in great detail. Where sin is concerned, God is a God of exclusion. The Bible expresses repeatedly that God, in His eternal kingdom, will categorically exclude every form of sin, many of which were depicted and celebrated in Paris's opening ceremony. And not only will God exclude sinful behavior from His kingdom, He will exclude people who are not willing to seek God's forgiveness and repent of such behavior. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. The book of Revelation gives much detail about the wrath of Almighty God, which will one day be poured upon mankind. Until then, sincere Christians must sigh and cry over all the abominations that are done while striving to deliver one of the Bible's central messages, turn from wickedness to righteousness. Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world, a message to humanity, to be aware of the deceivers and liars and the wolves in the sheep clothing. These are deliberate, evil people provoking God. But God will not be mocked. All honor and glory to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Witness to the faith. Despite the controversies at the Paris Olympics and the predictions of a chaotic period for the church, somewhere there is still the light of faith. Despite Rule 50 of the Olympic Charter, which prohibits any type of religious expression, some athletes have not hidden their faith and have proudly displayed it at key moments of the competition. Brazilian gymnast Rebecca Andrade won the gold medal in the women's floor final, earning her second Olympic gold and her sixth medal in total establishing herself as the best medalist among athletes from her country. In the competition, she beat out Simone Biles, the American Olympic gymnast who has won the most meals. In an interview, 
Andrade commented. This medal was not because I asked God for a medal. He gave me the opportunity to win it. I went through everything I had to go through. I worked, I sweated, I cried, I tried hard, I laughed, I had fun, I traveled. So I feel that I made this possible too. And he was always there, blessing me, protecting me, and feeling proud of me, knowing that his servant was always giving her best. Serbian tennis player Novak Djokovic, winner of the gold medal in the men's singles competition after beating Spain's Carlos Alcaraz, not only stood out for his skill on the court, but also for his orthodox Christian faith. Throughout the tournament, Djokovic wore a cross around his neck and, after winning the final, he told the media that God is the key to his success. I thank God for giving me his mercy, for giving me this blessing and this opportunity, he said. In trap shooting, Guatemalans Adriana Ruano and Jean-Pierre Brol made history by winning medals for their country. Ruano, who won the first gold medal for Guatemala, expressed her gratitude to God. He has been key in this process. He has given me the strength and confidence to be able to do this work. After her victory, Ruano traveled to the Vatican, where Pope Francis blessed her medal. Jean-Pierre Brol, who won bronze, also gave thanks to God, sharing before starting a competition. I asked him to give me the composure, the wisdom to be able to handle the situation, and he gave it to me, and here it is, here is the result. So, thanks to him for this. Reza Leal, the 16-year-old Brazilian skateboarder, not only won the bronze medal, but she also used her moment on the podium to make a declaration of faith. When receiving her medal, she expressed in sign language that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. This same gesture was replicated by her compatriot Caio Bonfim when he received the silver medal for racewalking pointing to the sky and showing his devotion to Jesus. Be ready for the end times and any time. Therefore you also be ready, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. So we don't know if it's going to be in our lifetime. We don't know if it's going to be in a hundred years, twenty-five years, ten years, or tomorrow. But if we have the mind of Jesus' bride, and knew that he was not coming for another 100 years, and we had the opportunity to live here on earth all that time, wouldn't we love and serve Jesus just as much? Wouldn't we still use every moment of that time to live for him? Because we shouldn't just start thinking about this and looking for how to prepare ourselves when there are things going on that seem like obvious or probable signs of the times. Our whole life should be lived in a spirit of expectation for that day, when we finally get to meet our Lord and Savior, our Bridegroom. We don't live in such a way that when we think it's the end times, we madly scramble to try and squeak through the door. We live our whole lives preparing for this day. And it is the love of Jesus who first loved us that compels us. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself that where I am, there you may be also, and where I go you know, and the way you know. Jesus said he is there now, preparing a place for us, and one day we will join him there in eternity. But there is a way that we need to go to get there, and we know the way. He is the way. He showed us the way. And he told us that not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. So that is the way to go, actively seeking and doing God's will. And what is God's will? That we do not sin, as far as we have light and understanding. Paul wrote to Timothy about perilous times that will come in the last days, but what he described as perilous times were not disasters, tribulations, and catastrophes. He defined peril as a time when people will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, proud, unloving, headstrong, amongst many other things. That's where the real danger is, in living in such a way that we become one of those people. But if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. He will show us when these things come up in us from the sin in our flesh. 
Then we can acknowledge that, love the truth about ourselves, and overcome these things through Him. That is what keeps us from perilous times. If we are consciously, faithfully living for Him, then we don't have to be afraid that we won't be ready. We don't need to think, do I have enough time left to get ready? All that is required is that we're faithful in this moment. So, while a whole long life of faithfulness and preparing ourselves is great, it's also true that if we start now and we're faithful from now on, then no matter when that day comes, we will be judged righteous. So there's no panic that we need X number of years to prepare ourselves. If we're faithful to do God's will, then we will be brought along into the kingdom of heaven. Then we belong there. If then you were raised with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ is, sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on things on the earth, for you died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is our life appears, then you also will appear with Him in glory. Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself, just as He is pure. Don't forget to keep the faith requires remembering what brought us to faith in the first place. We need to be intentional about remembering God's grace in our lives. Practically, this means remembering the wonderful gift of God's salvation and following the example of our Savior, who endured the trials of this life. We must fix our eyes on Jesus. Many people find prayer and journaling helpful in this regard. The Old Testament saints often demonstrated the importance of remembering. The Israelites were instructed to set up memorials, and many of the Jewish feasts were designed to remember and celebrate God's deliverance. Keeping the faith requires a love of truth and a commitment to the Word of God. Keeping the faith also involves growth in Christ. Jesus is the author of our faith, the one who initiated the relationship, and He is the perfecter of our faith, the one who will see it through to the end. From beginning to end, Jesus is the source of our faith. We remember what He has done, and we look forward to what He will do. Practically, this involves having an active prayer life, studying God's Word, and digging in to His truth. Keeping the faith is also about community. The Christian life is not lived exclusively between God and the individual. It is lived in community with other Christians. We will face trials and temptations in life. Our faith will be challenged. But it is not only in the difficult times that we dig in our heels and fight for our faith. No, we contend for our faith always. What we do today prepares us for what is in store tomorrow. God is always at work in our lives. Our faith should be ever-growing. For this very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, and to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. My brothers and sisters, make every effort to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We keep the faith by remembering God's faithfulness and continuing to grow in relationship with Him. We will be like Him, and we will be with Him for eternity. This is our ultimate goal, the desire of our heart. It's what we live for, what our whole lives revolve around, our beloved Savior and Bridegroom. So we can truly lift up our heads and look forward to that day when we finally get to meet Him and be with Him forever.